All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. All right, in this lesson here, we are going to be discussing fentanyl. So let's start off with our history and background like usual. So the pharmaceutical company Janssen first developed fentanyl in 1959 for primarily the use as an anesthetic and pain reliever. Fentanyl really started becoming widely available as an IV anesthetic during the 1960s. Fentanyl citrate is the commonly used version of IV fentanyl, which is created by combining fentanyl and citric acid at a one-to-one -one ratio. And this is the version that's most commonly known by the trade name sublimase. And then outside of IV use, uh, we do have fentanyl patches that were introduced, as well as, get this, flavored lollipops. Gotta love this stuff. So fentanyl itself is an opioid analgesic from the opioid family, which includes other drugs such as morphine, codeine, and oxycodone. Uh, it is considered a Schedule II controlled substance by the DEA, which means there is a high potential for abuse, which may lead to severe psychological or physical dependence. Now, the way that uh, fentanyl works is it actually binds with the opioid receptors in the central nervous system, so regions of the brain and spinal cord, and thus alters the perception and emotional response to pain. Uh, fentanyl and other opioid uh, agonists appear to relieve pain by mimicking the actions of endogenous opioid peptides and primarily activation of the mu but also the kappa receptors. So the mu receptor activation uh, response includes analgesia, respiratory depression, euphoria, and sedation, while the kappa receptors, uh, their activation response includes analgesia and sedation. All right, so for our indications for the use of fentanyl. So we can primarily think of these in the categories of anesthesia, sedation, and analgesia. So it is an adjunctive use in general as well as regional anesthesia. Um, for general anesthesia, uh, we can use it in conjunction with various anesthesia gases, automidate, paralytics, as well as when we're using it regionally, it can be in conjunction with bupivacaine or rapivacaine, which are anesthetics that then cause numbing to specific areas. Now we can use it to induce or maintain anesthesia and sedation, and this can be helpful in ventilator compliance. Uh, it is very helpful with post-operative pain, restlessness, tachypnea, uh, and emergence delirium. So it can be used to manage acute pain, as well as it can also be used to manage the moderate to severe chronic pain in patients who are opioid tolerant, but are requiring around the clock opioid analgesia for an extended period of time. Uh, it can also be used for breakthrough cancer pain for patients who are already receiving or tolerating opioids. And then just in general, it's a potent analgesic sedative that has less hypotensive effect than the other opioids. And this is primarily due to the lack of the histamine release, as well as it has the shortest duration. So this actually makes it an excellent choice for the use in critically ill patients. Now, for our contraindications, um, the only real contraindication would be if the patient has an allergy or hypersensitivity to the drug or known history of intolerance to the drug. There are some cautions, though. Uh, we do want to use it in caution with patients with brain tumors, COPD, decreased respiratory reserve, uh, potentially compromised respirations, uh, hepatic and renal disease, or cardiac bradyarrhythmias. And then opioids can cause sleep-related breathing disorders, uh, including central sleep apnea and sleep-related hypoxemia. All right, so on to our adverse effects. Um, there's quite a few, so we're going to go through these system by system. Um, first, we have the central nervous system, and here we're looking at confusion, euphoria, sedation, uh, somnolence, seizures, anxiety, depression, dizziness, hallucinations, and headache. For cardiovascular, it can lead to arrhythmias, chest pain, hypertension, hypotension, bradycardia, DVT, and PE. For ENT, uh, rhinitis is a possibility, along with pharyngitis, dry eyes, and swelling. For the GI, it does slow down the motility, so this can lead to constipation, abdominal pain, 
ileus, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, can also, within the gentle urinary, can lead to urine retention. Uh, for a respiratory, it can lead to apnea, hypoventilation, respiratory depression, and dyspnea. In the skin, it can lead to diaphoresis, puritis, as well as erythema at the application site if we're doing transdermal applications. And then finally, uh, as another category, physical dependence to its use. All right, so let's talk about our dosing. So for our common concentrations, often when we're using this as an IV push, we're gonna find this in 100 micrograms in two ml vials, giving us a 50 microgram per ml concentration. For our IV infusion, um, this really can vary depending on, on what uh, brand or uh, preparation that your facility uses. Commonly, we're gonna see something like 1,000 micrograms and 100 mLs, giving us a 10 microgram per mL concentration of a pre-filled bag. We can also find these in pre-filled syringes as well, uh, either for continuous infusions or PCA dosing as well. All right, for the dosing itself, um, for IV pushes, uh, we're typically gonna give this anywhere from 25 to 100 micrograms in a dose. For our continuous IV administration, protocols really are going to vary on this depending on the facility and the infusion reasons. But in general, so if we're using this for sedation and pain management in patients who are mechanically ventilated, then our dose can range anywhere from 25 to 250 micrograms per hour. Generally, we're going to start this at 25 to 50 mics per hour. The effect that we're going for is generally going to be monitored by our RAS score if we're using it for sedation as well as our CPOT uh, if we are using it for analgesia. We can also use this in a uh, patient-controlled analgesia pump, so a PCA pump. And so here we're going to get orders from the provider that may or may not include any of the following, um, an initial bolus dose, potentially a continuous dose, uh, what the demand dose is going to be, so each time the, the patient hits the button, what the demand dose interval is going to be between the doses they can give, um, if there's any PRN bolus doses for breakthrough pain that we can give, uh, as well as a total maximum dose allowed and lockout, which is usually going to be measured every four hours. Now, for the pharmacokinetics, uh, the medication can be given uh, many different routes, oral, IM, IV, intranasal, intradermal, transmucosal, as well as it can also be given as an adjunct to the anesthetic agent via either an epidural or an intrathecal catheter. Um, it is primarily metabolized by the liver and then excreted primarily in the urine, uh, although partially through feces as well. It is highly lipophilic though, so extended use as well as larger doses tend to accumulate in the adipose tissue and can lead to prolonged effects, uh, especially as we're weaning or turning this medication off. As for onset peak and duration, um, obviously this is going to vary depending on how you give it, um, but the main thing we're focused on here is our IV administration. So it has an onset of one to two minutes, peaks in about three to five minutes, and has a pretty short duration of just about 30 to 60 minutes. The antidote for this is going to be our naloxone or Narcan, so our opioid antagonist. And here we're giving anywhere from 0.4 to 2 milligrams IV every 2 to 3 minutes, uh, up to a max of 10 milligrams, but we can also do the continuous infusion as well. All right, so for our nursing considerations, um, respiratory depression and or death can result when we're using this medication, even as it's intended or recommended to be used. So we do want to monitor patients closely, especially in the first 24 to 72 hours during the initiation or drug changes. So make sure that we do have a pulse ox in place, and even more preferable, especially if the patient is not intubated, uh, to have an entitled CO2, as this is going to give us an earlier recognition of respiratory depression. Now, we don't want to stop treatment abruptly, especially if they've been on this medication for prolonged periods of time. Um, we do want to withdraw it slowly and gradually taper the dose to prevent the signs and symptoms of withdrawal, worsening pain, psychological distress, uh, especially those patients who are dependent on it. So some of the signs and symptoms of opioid withdrawal are going to include things like restlessness, perspiration, chills, irritability, anxiety, insomnia, joint pain, weakness, abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, increased blood pressure and or heart rate, as well as an increased respiratory rate. Now we do want to monitor uh, circulatory and respiratory status as well as uh, urinary function pretty carefully. Make sure that we are frequently monitoring our vital signs as well as the bladder function. 
high doses and prolonged doses may lead to constipation, so we want to be assessing bowel function as well as the need for any potential bowel care regimen, as well as make sure that we have naloxone and Narcan available as needed, so if we do have any uh, signs and symptoms of intentional or accidental overdose. And then finally, for some relevant laboratory studies, uh, may increase amylase and lipase levels, so we do want to periodically check those. All right, and that was our review of fentanyl. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that. As well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.